Order, order. Can I welcome everybody to this meeting of the DWP Select Committee, which is the third in our inquiry into the DWP's preparations for changes in the world of work. In our first two meetings in this inquiry, we've looked at uh, youth employment and the impact of automation expected on the labour market in the future. Today we are discussing universal basic income. Now there's a great deal of interest in this subject. We've had uh, emails from over 19,000 people uh, about it and um, I've, I've no doubt there will be uh, many people following our discussion um, on uh, TV uh, today. Uh, and we're going to hear from people with a range of views, both for and against UBI. Um, I, I just wanted to make clear we're, we're not making any decisions about our recommendations to the government today. We're going to be hearing more evidence in this inquiry in the coming months and we'll publish a report with our conclusions, but that'll be, I would imagine, early next year. Can I also just make the point that um, we will observe the two-minute silence at 11 o'clock, which I expect will be during the, the second panel, um, and um, just so you're aware that, that there will be that, that pause at 11 o'clock, as today is Remembrance Day. Uh, can I welcome all the witnesses who've joined us for this first panel, and thank you all very much for being with us. What I'd like to, to ask if I may in starting is if each of you could tell us who you are but also indicate to us whether you think universal basic income is a good idea and given that this is a, an inquiry about the future of the, the world of work if you could just very briefly say what are the main factors which have led you to take the view that you do take on this subject. Um, so can I start with uh, Mr. Lansley, please, Stuart Lansley. Okay, well, I, um, I'm a, a visiting fellow at the University of Bristol, um, and I've written several reports for Compass about the feasibility of uh, basic income. I think that I started out uh, slightly sceptical uh, about the idea, but I, I guess I've become a convert. Um, and uh, I just think that the, the circumstances of, of, of the last 20 years, you know, the sort of rolling system of shocks that we've had to the system has greatly increased the level of insecurity and uncertainty in society. And the present system of social security really isn't, you know, designed for the modern economy, the great polarization in jobs and, 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 and the volatility in incomes. And I, I, mean, I think there are lots of other reasons for a basic income, uh, but I think perhaps one of the most fundamental ones is that will provide a degree of social resilience and security for households that's lacking in the present system. Thank you very much. Pavlina Dragonova. Hi, um, my name is Pavlina Dragunova. I'm here on behalf of the Organized Network. We are a network of over 800,000 workers from across the UK uh, who support each other to win better rights and conditions at work. And I will be speaking on behalf of the network and therefore there's a range of reasons why people support a basic income ranging from uh, their own personal security and stability. A lot of people have been knocked off their feet by the coronavirus crisis. Um, also, uh, people talk about wanting to volunteer more and spend more time in their communities. And some people support a basic income just because they want to feel like they live in a more fair and compassionate society. So I'll be trying to represent all of these views today. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Peter Alcock. Uh, uh, I uh, was an emeritus professor from the University of Birmingham. Uh, my, uh, my academic career has been in social policy, uh, and much of that time has been involved doing research on social security policy and also on welfare rights, people trying to access social security benefits. I'm, the, the idea of a universal income is, is an attractive one in principle, but I've always been worried about the practicalities of it, and I remain... Uh, therefore, uh, uh, an, an opponent of it as a practical solution to the kind of problems uh, that we face today, as in, uh, because and I'm not sure that they're terribly different to those that we've faced before, albeit that this is a changing world. I have two main concerns about uh, 
just two broad main concerns about the universal basic income. The first is its economic uh, practicality. Uh, how feasible would it be to introduce it? And the second is its sort of political and policy consequences. Uh, the, pursuing a, a universal basic income may come at the cost of other policy priorities, which I think would be much more important uh, in, in the current climate. Thank you very much. And Professor David Piershow. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I first got involved in uh, basic income in 1967, which dates me, uh, um, when there was discussion about demographics and negative taxes in the USA. And uh, I'm now um, uh, long after emeritus professor at uh, LSE, where I've taught most of his, my life. Um, you, you, you posed the question about being for or against uh, UBI. Um, I think uh, there's a huge amount of confusion about it. Um, the aim that everyone should have a basic income, a basic command over resources, including health care, um, education, uh, housing, um, is not one, well, it's one I would very positively support. Uh, the question that the, the UBI, though, is usually uh, discussed in terms of a particular mechanism and a technique. And even here, there's a confusion between modifications of tax allowances and uh, minor, well, significant, but, uh, but important uh, 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 but very modest um, basic income, or what one might call the real McCoy that uh, Milton Friedman, uh, extreme neoliberal, um, uh, would probably be backing Trump, um, basically wanted to abolish the whole of Social Security uh, with an unconditional uh, poverty level uh, uh, basic income. And that seems to me uh, what 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 the full universal basic income is, and that, it, it, for a number of reasons, seems to me uh, uh, unattractive and, uh, and 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 impossible. It's uh, it's it's not a fair system because it makes no distinction about why people um, are lacking income. It, to provide, say, half average income uh, would be cost three times what the uh, social security system now costs because it would basically go to three times as many people very roughly. Uh, I don't think it deals with the problems of the future of uh, the labour market and I don't think uh, when one gets down to it that politically uh, almost anyone really supports that. So, so I think the whole discussion has been much confused and uh, uh, um, I can go into more detail about that um, later. Thank you. Well, we no doubt will invite you to do so. Thank you very. Thank you all very much. I'm um, Steve McCabe. Morning. Um, well, I mean, I, I guess what I'm interested to know is if we were to introduce a, a universal basic income uh, in the circumstances we're currently in. Do you think it should be on a permanent basis or do you think it should be on a temporary basis? Uh, and I'm not exactly sure who's best equipped to answer that, so I'm going to leave it to the panel to decide. Let's go in the same order. Mr Lansley first. Okay, well, I mean, I think that when COVID broke, um, uh, there was certainly was a discussion about the possibility of an emergency, emergency basic income. I mean, yes. the problem the problem was that, 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 that it wasn't oven ready. You know, that, that in order to execute a basic income, you need a, a list of every resident in the UK. We simply don't have that. We have lots of lists of uh, of people who are you know, the, the tax list. We have a driving license list and, and so on. Uh, and in order to execute an emergency scheme, we'd have had to get government departments to get together and, and produce such a list. Um, so uh, I, I think we've probably gone beyond the point when, when we need an emergency scheme. Of course, of course, the government could have done something. Uh, they could have put up child benefit. Um, child benefit is a basic income for children. And it's known to be a very powerful uh, instrument against poverty 
and they could have put it up by a sort of modest amount, ten pound or, or or something like that, and that would have done you know a small amount to protect families. Um, so, but I think if if we imagine that a basic income had been in place at the beginning of this year, it would have been a very powerful instrument for dealing with this kind of shock. I mean, we we've had this succession of devastating shocks over the last 30 or 40 years. You know, we, we've had deindustrialization, we've had globalization, we've had austerity, we've had, you know, the robotic revolution, and now we've got uh, COVID. Each of these shocks uh, have had a fairly devastating income uh, effect upon household finances, um, upon job opportunities and livelihoods. And it's really shaken up each generation of significant proportion of the workforce. Now, if we'd had COVID, if we'd had UBI at the beginning of this system, it could have been used as, a, as an automatic mechanism for providing a, D of, a degree of protection. So I think that, you know, that these shocks are not going to go away. So I think the debate now should move on from the idea of an emergency scheme to a permanent scheme. And what we nearly need to be looking at is uh, what kind of uh, scheme would be feasible to overcome some of the objections that, you know, Dave, David Pisho and, 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 uh, and Peter and others are, 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 are aiming at, uh, at UBI. OK, thank you very much. Ms Dragonova. Um, so I can't speak to the idea of a permanent basic income. However, we asked uh, members of the network whether they thought it should be a temporary or a long-term measure. And overwhelmingly, out of over 8,000 people we asked this question to, over 80% said they thought it should be a long-term measure. And the reasons they gave for why they would need a basic income were also long-term reasons. Um, I'm going to quote a few people now. Um, so in terms of security and stability, a lot of people said uh, it would offer them a baseline to get back on their feet. And some of these reasons were crisis related and some of them weren't. So James from Oxford said, it would make a huge difference to my stability and health. The recent pandemic has been a huge hit to physical and mental health. I was working as a nursing assistant in infectious diseases and I caught COVID. Then the stress brought on a relapse of depression and I had to leave my job. A basic income would allow me to focus on getting and staying well take a lot of stress off my shoulders and eventually give me the stability to focus on retraining and gaining new qualifications. So part of the reason people need a basic income is to kind of weather them through the crisis. But also a lot of people talked about um, being able to spend more time caring for vulnerable family members, volunteering in their communities, um, training to be magistrates, for instance, there's a big shortage of magistrates in this country. Um, so it would also unlock the potential of people to be able to spend more time doing other kinds of socially valuable work, which is again, a long term could, concern. Could, could, I finally, just, could I just ask yes. if it is to be a permanent, uh, replacement for the existing welfare, how, how much would it cost to introduce and how long would it take to introduce it? Um, so I think we're going to get to that question later on in the debate in terms of specific rates. There's different uh, models. I believe that the model that Stuart is advancing is not a replacement for the existing welfare state, but rather it's a minimum floor that sits below the existing okay. welfare state and is similar to child benefit and that it's just a secure amount of money that you get each month. OK, sorry to interrupt. No worries. Um, yeah, and finally, there was kind of these uh, wider concerns about who we are as a society and as a country. Um, Ted from Oxford said, I don't think it would change my life, but it would reassure me that I lived in a society that could function more fairly and justly. And we had a lot of people also saying, it wouldn't really impact me monetarily. I know I'd have to pay more tax in order to enable this to happen, but I just think it's the right thing to do. OK. I wonder, Prof you. Pr Professor Alcott, you've indicated you're, you, you don't support the measure, but do you think in the current circumstances with the pandemic and so on, there, 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 there was a case, there would have been a case for adopting this temporarily? Uh, uh, no, I don't. Uh, partly for the reason that, that Malcolm was outlining before, uh, it would be difficult to do it on a temporary basis because of the logistics of, of getting it up and running. Um, that, that, of course, is not a, a reason for not doing it in principle, but, a, but, a, but in an emergency, you need something that's an urgent response, and it isn't there to do that. 
But also, I can't really see the logic of having a, a temporary basic income. The, the primary arguments for it, as indeed were just being articulated, are to do with the way in which it may change society. Uh, and that's a, that's a long-term change. Uh, but, but whether it were temporary or permanent, it seems to me that the problems about determining the level, how much it would cost, uh, and whether it really would uh, lift the people uh, who need protection uh, from poverty out of poverty, uh, remain the same questions. Uh, and I still don't think uh, that a basic income has a, the proposal, proponents of a universal basic income have an answer to those questions. Uh, because they're practical questions about how you deliver it. Professor Pierce, anything to add? Uh, well, I, uh, although not generally in favour of universal basic income, I agree entirely with what uh, Stuart Lansley said about uh, raising child benefit, because that's a universal benefit, which does seem to me uh, targeted at, um, predominantly at, at those who've got the extra costs of, of, of children and, and raising it in the circumstances of the uh, COVID um, situation would seem to be very sensible. But, but having it generally doesn't seem to me to, to fit the circumstances in which many people's jobs uh, uh, have continued and, and, and their earnings are, are, are uh, unchanged, but many very many uh, employed and particularly self-employed people have lost income so that something that is 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 targeted at the circumstances seems to me far more uh, efficient but in the long run the fact that the tax system and the social security system barely communicate with each other uh, and that, that, that basically government doesn't have any means of uh, uh, accessing the whole population efficiently is 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 um, um, puts uh, the UK rather behind uh, Indian developments. Um, so that um, so that, that a, an ability to respond effectively to to changing to to a crisis uh, is is very limited. Thank you. But I don't think a universal basic income would would uh, it would provide some sort of framework. But um, but it but it, it wouldn't have been particularly fitted to the, the the present crisis. Okay, thank you, Steve. Did you want to come back on that at all? No, I think that's that's fine, Chair. Thank that's you very much. Thank you very much, Siobhan Bailey. Thank you, thank you all for for joining us. Um, I think because if you ask people and sort of we knock on a lot of doors uh, with our weird hobby of politics, and if you ask people, it's a good idea if the government should give everybody cash. Uh, the answer is usually yes, and if you ask people if they want to pay extra taxes for social good, the answer is yes. But then if you start asking them whether they think MPs should get extra cash from the uh, or, or CEOs of companies from the government, it would be a no. And we know that parties that propose even hypothecated taxes, uh, elections don't don't often uh, prosper. So I'm I'm really interested in as an honest look at the disadvantages of of UBI and and the reality that not everybody needs a basic income um, and, and how uh, there would be a justification for providing that, um, that, that income a, a, across society even when there, there's no need. Uh, Mr Tory, do you want to start on that? Okay, Sorry. Mr Lansley, apologies. Oh, okay. um, Yes, I mean this. This is one of this is one of the you know a sort of a regular criticisms of um, a basic income that it would go to everybody, including the rich. Um, I mean it, it, the, the, the the concept of universalism, either everybody is entitled to something, is embedded in the welfare state. So we have you know lar large sections of the welfare state that go to everybody: the national health service, education. You know, and child and child benefit, although it's now taxed back from from higher tax payers. And the reason for that is that um, that we want to give equal access to everybody to sort of absolutely basic services. Uh, and, and these have been, you know, incredibly effective. You know, the National Health Service education system has been very very effective in creating a, a level playing field. Um, for health. Child benefit uh, has been very, very effective instrument against against poverty. Um, and and, and the, 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 what's happened to the social security system 
over, since the war is that Bev, Beveridge always intended the, the social security system to basically be based on national insurance and that national assistance, the means tested bit, would be residual and would eventually die out. In fact, we've had exactly the reverse of that. You know, we've had a great expansion in means testing and we've had uh, a reduction in universalism. And I think one of the big cases for a basic income is that it would try and correct that balance, balance a little bit. Um, it, it, it would be um, uh, restore an element of universality. And we all know the arguments against means tested and the arguments for universality. Um, but but, but the, the, the other thing is, is, I think we have to recognize that it's not just low income families uh, that um, are subject to the effects of COVID and technological change and all these things that are happening at the moment. It's moving up the income scale. So a lot of people who've lost their jobs, who, 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 who are suffering from volatile incomes at the moment, are in the middle income groups, and some of them are higher income groups. And, and the effects of automation will also affect people on middle income groups. Uh, so I think this the degree of social protection does need to go up the income scale. Um, but the other thing is that is the, it's perfectly possible to design even a modest basic income scheme. Uh, and we at Compass, we favor, we don't favor a big full big bang scheme that would replace the existing social security system. What we prefer is to start small, to have a, a modest starter rate that would act like a sort of plimsoll line, uh, a guaranteed income below which nobody would fall, uh, sitting under the existing social security system. Now the thing about the thing about basic income is that you have to look at it not just as a reform of social security but also a reform of the tax system. It's really a package we're talking about, we're changing the uh, social security and, and the tax system. And it's perfectly possible to de design a system uh, with adjustments to the tax system that claw um, the basic income payment back from higher income groups. Indeed, the, the, the model that, 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 that we're advocating at Compass uh, is highly progressive. It would concentrate all the gains at the bottom, even though everybody's getting a flat rate basic income, it would concentrate the gains amongst the, 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 the poorest third, it would be roughly neutral in the middle, um, and it would actually make you know higher income groups slightly worse off. So there would be a re level of redistribution taking place between the top and the bottom. Thank you. Thank you. Should we go through, Mr. Yeah, Dragonova? I would love to hear from yeah, you. Yeah, let's hear from everybody. Mr. Dragonova, your comments on this. Thanks. Um, yeah, I would agree. I mean, um, I completely see your point about uh, the reticence of people to to understand to to see why higher income groups should should get this um, this benefit. However, I think first of all. Um, it, a lot of people view it slightly differently to a regular benefit and more as a, as a right, as something that is kind of a glue that gels society together. And it's, and it's something that we're entitled to because each of us is a valued member of society, um, which contributes to making that society great as it is. Um, the second thing is that we polled, uh, again, organized members and asked whether their income had mostly stayed the same or changed a lot um, as a result of COVID. And over half of people said they, their income had changed a lot. So I think this crisis has made a lot more people feel the precarity that is um, generally felt by uh, low income gig economy workers. Um, and also it would be a mistake to think about the end of this crisis as the end of this precarious state because we have Brexit coming around the corner, um, which is going to lead to a lot of shifts in our economy. We have the longer term challenge of the climate crisis, which is going to require uh, a lot of people to be retraining into, into completely new industries. And for all of these issues, um, we need a stronger social safety net, which enables people to change jobs, change industries, weather these crises without uh, being worried about how they're gonna put food on the table. Professor Alcock. Um, it's interesting, what, what's entered the discussion now is, is some distinction between what's sometimes referred to as a partial basic income and a universal basic income. Uh, and I think the question about who deserves or what the consequences 
of paying these benefits uh, would be are slightly different depending upon whether, you, whether you're talking about a universal or a partial basic income. The, the problem with the universal basic income, which pays people enough to live on, uh, is that in order to provide for enough uh, people with enough to live on, you'd have to raise taxes at, a, at an incredibly high rate uh, to pay people the sort of money that you're, even if you'd set it at the current um, income support level, it would be incredibly expensive in, in tax terms. And of course, it would pay money to people who potentially could then do nothing. And there's a moral question, which we might return to later, about whether we should be paying uh, people to do nothing. Uh, and and uh, and whether uh, and not make any contribution to the society in which they live. If you pay a partial basic income, and that is a, a relatively small payment to people, which I think is what Compass and some other groups have been proposing, uh, I suppose my main concern about that is it's neither fish nor fowl. It doesn't actually give you the benefits of a universal basic income because it isn't enough for people to live on. So consequently, you need to retain all of the existing social security system in order to uh, support people, uh, at the, those people who do need support uh, at a level to keep them out of poverty. Or, uh, and therefore, you're not making any significant change uh, to, the, uh, to the infrastructure of social security and taxation. And yet, it will cost an awful lot of money to implement that. The transaction costs of taking money off people and giving it back to them is unnecessarily high. Now, I'm a strong proponent of the redistribution of wealth, and I think we do need to try and move resources away from some of the people at the top who have far more than they need towards people at the bottom who have much less than they need. Uh, but a basic income is not the best way to do that, uh, and it wouldn't be the best way, I don't think, to win support for those kinds of changes. Thank you. Professor Pierce. Uh Well, I very much agree with, with what... Uh, Pete Olcox just said um, that, that there are attractions to a, a modest partial basic income, but I don't see it as really a, a first step towards a, a, a much broader system uh, for, for, for a number of reasons. Um, and, and, and really, one has to compare uh, a universal basic income with, with social security. Um, uh, now, Part of the problem of social security is it's very complex, but um, taking account of, of, of housing costs, uh, of uh, um, living arrangements, um, uh, how people are clumped together, um, taking account of people's disabilities, but, but those are real um, factors which affect people's uh, needs. Um, and, and, and it's very difficult to get away from all of that. But most fundamentally, that, 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 that Social Security, the biggest government program there is, is, is very efficient. It tags the groups that it aims to help, the retired, the disabled, uh, children um, and unemployed people. And, and it's, it, it's perhaps on unemployed people that the issue becomes most focused because, because the advocates of uh, UBI want that to be entirely unconditional. Uh, in the literature, this has got focused on on surfers. Um, should should uh, MPs, for example, be free to um, chuck in their jobs, um, uh, demanding as they are, um, uh, and and simply say, well, I, I'm not going to do anything for society anymore. I'll I'll just surf, but I would like to enjoy an adequate basic income, and uh, I I. I puritanical, retaining the work ethic, if you like. Um, but I think in line with most people's views on this, don't think um, people should be uh, entirely free to do that unconditionally. Unemployment benefits have conditions attached. Uh, they have some sanctions, which may be unduly harsh, but, um, but there are conditions. And, and, and simply to say everyone completely regardless is free to get an adequate income to live on uh, is not something which I think many people, when it comes down to it, really support, and, and, uh, and I don't. 
Thank you. Siobhan. Thank you. It's, it's really helpful to sort of touch on the um, justifications for unemployment because I, I, you know, all of us here are on this committee because we want to improve the welfare system. We want to find gaps and we want to uh, make universal credit, for example, work better. And I do think that would help meet the job losses that unfortunately we're seeing at the moment. But we've been really looking into the future of work and we know that many projections race, uh, relating to the future of the labour market um, suggest that technological development like automation are going to create more jobs than they replace um, so not necessarily leading to the mass displacement of workers that, that is sometimes being feared about automation um, it, it, have you looked uh, can I ask us so one of uh, one of our detractors and one of our um, uh, one of our uh, supporters of UBI you know have you looked into that side of things and 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 on that basis do you still think that there is um, uh, any justification for UBI I think Professor Olcock, if I could start with you. Sorry, just repeat the, the last bit of the question. Yeah, what? So, because because the the projections of the future of the labour market, we think that automation is actually going to create yeah, more yeah, jobs. Yeah. You know, have, have, have you looked at that, and and does that change your views? Well. Well, to be honest, I haven't uh, I haven't done uh, any research work on the likely impact of automation, but I know it's been advanced as a, as a reason for the universal basic income. The, the logic being, as I understand it, uh, that, and to some extent, of course, we already live in this world, as as, as robots and other forms of production are able to take a, to, to replace the jobs that human beings have done. And there will be fewer jobs for human beings and therefore less need for people to work to do them. I do think, however, that argument has been massively overplayed. For a start, there are an awful lot of jobs that automation will never replace. Uh, they've just been round em down our street a little earlier, emptying the bins. I, I, I can't see that being replaced. And of course, there's much more, uh, well, emptying the bins is important, but uh, care work, uh, uh, work in the health service and work in education. There's all sorts of jobs that, that we're going to need human beings to do. And we need to make sure that human beings are appropriately uh, uh, trained, supported and remunerated for the work that they do. Uh, and it seems to me, therefore, we will remain a largely wage-based economy for the foreseeable future. And it's in the context of that largely wage-based economy that the universal basic income, it seems to me, just doesn't work. Uh, it, it doesn't work if it's a generous, enough, generous enough to mean that people don't work, uh, because then you've got a problem of who would empty the bins and why should they. Uh, and, it, and if it's not generous enough to remove people from, uh, uh, from the need to work, then of course you're going to have to retain all of the supports that you currently have that, uh, that David was outlining before uh, and the special needs that go with them within the social security system. So, so I don't think uh, uh, automation is such a powerful social change, will be such a powerful social change. Mr. Mr. Lansley, do you want to comment on how automation changes the argument? Yes, I mean, I think I, I broadly agree that that, that uh, automation uh, will probably end up with you know roughly the roughly the same number of jobs, uh, but with, with a lag. Uh, but what what it will be is very disruptive. There's there's no doubt it, it's it's going to be you know huge upheaval in in certain industries. Um, I mean, you know, that several insurance companies have just abolished all their staff and replaced them with robot, robots. You know, I mean, the, the it's, it's, and I mean, most, most of the evidence suggests we're going to end up with a more polarised society, and a lot, a lot of you know, there'd be a bit of a hollowing out of the middle, um, and there'd be more very high-paid jobs and more kind of low-paid jobs. So, you know, that sort of basic income would con contribute to, uh, to, 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 to evening, evening that out. But I just, I'd also like just to respond to sort of David, David's point about, um, you know, that, that a basic income. You know, is it going to encourage the disincentive to work, and lots of people will, you know, sit around being idle? I, I mean, I, I think that again, we have to distinguish between these two models. You know, there's the full, the big bang model that that you pay everybody at, uh, at a decent income level, um, and that that would affect the incentive to work. Although, don't forget, you know, that the, the work ethic in Britain is very strong. You know. Um, uh, but the model that we're talking about, which is this sort of modest income floor, this pencil line as a low level, um, uh, the evidence of that is, is it, it wouldn't have in, 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 
an effect on the center to work. In fact, it would probably be probably be roughly pro work. Um, I, 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 you know, there will be some people who come off means tested benefits uh, who will be better off transferring from unemployment going into work because they keep the basic income when they move in. But also what, the, what a, a sort of basic, a, a small basic income would do, it would change people's relationship. It would give people more choice over the big, some of the big decisions in life, you know, because they've got a cushion. So, uh, you know, more people, I mean, it would probably, it would probably encourage entrepreneurialism because more people would would be prepared to take the risks of starting up a shop or a small business or you know trying their hand at music or or writing or, or whatever uh, and also i think we have to understand the nature of work isn't just about paid work it's also about unpaid work you know and estimates suggest that something like um a third of gdp is there's an equivalent of about a third of gdp in people who do unpaid work in terms of caring and volunteering, of course that isn't counted. And this system might actually rebalance um, it, it slightly towards that kind, kind of work. It, it, it could be a charter for caring and volunteering. So I think if we're talking about this basic income floor, um, these arguments uh, against um, because it's going to encourage idleness is uh, much, much weaker. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sir Desmond Swain. Um, I put it to you that um, unemployment can behave like any other commodity, namely, the more you pay for it, the more you will have of it. If people can have an adequate income uh, without going to work, why would they trouble themselves with going to work? Even the best jobs involve all sorts of hassles and stress uh, and travel uh, and disincentives. So how will that affect enterprise? We already know of many enterprises that have had to close down or go elsewhere because they could not find uh, workers. How, will it be the case that actually a universal income will drive automation because enterprises have to automate because they can't get the workers because they're paid sufficiently for doing nothing. Who wants to start on that one? Ms. Dragonova, do you want to comment on that? Hi, yes. Um, so I have a, a few points um, to make. Firstly, on the idea that uh, basic income would discourage work, which is unsubstantiated. Um, I think that the idea of should MPs be surfers or would they become surfers is entirely a theoretical question. Um, in reality, uh, people um, are saying that first of all, you know, lockdown has made them miss their jobs. They have hated being idle during this period. It's made them feel depressed. They are so excited to be able to go back to work and to contribute. Um, again, people have talked a lot about volunteering. Um, Claire from Devon has said, if I got a UBI, I would work part time and spend the rest of the time volunteering as I do now. I helped plant 2,200 2, trees last winter and I plan to do more this winter. To argue that UBI makes people in, uh, indolent and lazy is incorrect. Look at the number of people who have stepped up to volunteer during COVID when they didn't have to work. So I do not believe that uh, people will stop working because they receive a basic income. What we are seeing is people unable to work because of the mental and physical health impact of the constant financial stress they're under. So a lot of people talked about um, saying my financial situation right now is a question mark. Uh, my financial situation is so erratic that it's difficult to plan anything. Um, I'm under continuous stress. And they said receiving a basic income would allow them to sleep at night and enable them to work better as a result of not having this constant stress. And we also heard from business owners, if I can just quote you one, um, Lucy from Staffordshire said, as a business owner, it would mean I could possibly afford to put more money into my business, possibly expand, even employ others. Removing some of the financial pressures off people helps their well-being in many other ways and a health, healthier and happier workforce can only be a good thing. So 
in, in my view, from hearing people, the main impediment to work is the constant financial stress of having to juggle two or three jobs, none of which give you enough to live on, and having to, to have this worry. This is not a workforce that's going to level up Britain if they're worrying about how they're going to survive the week. Thank you. Uh, Professor Pierce, do you want to comment on this one? Well, the, the, there have been uh, a number of advocates of a full universal basic income who have been uh, uh, worth billions and billions in Silicon Valley, who, who see the world as going to be one in which uh, the, the, the demands for labor are going to be very limited. So the, out of uh, a crisis of conscience, they think a universal basic income would support the rest. That seems to me a, a very... Uh, um, bleak view. It's 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 what Harari uh, wrote about uh, in a, in a when he said there might be a new not unworking class, a useless class, not merely unemployed but unemployable, and and it, it, rather than be thinking about a universal basic income in relation to that, I think one has to think about how can one avoid that situation because if 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 there were a persistent high rate of non-employment, um, um, then, then it seems to me very probable that those who were uh, not employed would, would have a very low level of income because, because those in work would, would see them as undeserving and, and, and not be willing to pay uh, the costs of, of, of decent unemployment benefits. And, uh, one can argue about whether unemployment benefits in Britain now are at a decent level. Um, so so the, 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 the challenge seems to me to find uh, ways into the future in which everyone can make a contribution and has a responsibility to make a contribution who's, who's able-bodied and uh, uh, working age, um, rather than uh, imagine that uh, a universal basic income is going to make it pos possible that we have a decent society in which uh, um, those who own and operate the uh, uh, robots uh, enjoy a, a high standard of living and the rest are dependent on a universal basic income. I, I, I think the, the, the future of the labor market and, and, and the questions you're considering on, on, on uh, the select committee are, are, are absolutely crucial, but I don't see a universal basic income as being a desirable or, or really a fee politically feasible or certainly a politically attractive way forward. Okay, thank you. Sir Desmond. Can I come back to Pavlina uh, and put it to you that volunteering and working are clean different things. Volunteering, you choose the level of your commitment and you choose what it is you're going to volunteer at. Going to work is not the same thing at all necessarily. Uh, and the danger is that you will, by creating a universal income, create an armor of, army of volunteers doing all sorts of worthy things, but not necessarily the things that are efficient and required as dictated by a functioning market with a price mechanism. Uh, I, think, um, I think this crisis has laid bare the fact that not all uh, paid work is the same as, as the most socially valuable work. Um, some, some jobs which are paid are of questionable value to society and some roles which are unpaid or very badly paid um, were revealed to be key, key jobs for keeping our society afloat during this crisis. Uh, I think that, that your question refers to a larger question about what, what kinds of work we value, which is another question that this pandemic has posed to us and will only continue to become more relevant, as I mentioned, as some sectors have to be wound down and some have to be expanded to address the climate crisis that we're facing longer term. Okay, thank you. I'm, go I'm going to bring in Siobhan Bailey, who wanted to raise a point, and then I can see Professor Alcott wants to uh, contribute as well. So, Siobhan, do you want to... Thank you. Pavelina um, mentioned that the people, the, the, the comments about people stop, stopping working or wouldn't work if they were paid a, a universal basic income um, was unsubstantiated. It's really a motive, a motive conversation, because nobody wants to suggest people are lazy, and you know, it, it's, it's a very difficult thing. But, but 
but I think we need to look at some evidence because I know that the, the Finland trial where I think there was a, a, a stipend, a, universe, a universal basic income trial, about 2,000 people, um, many of whom remain jobless and they, they, they didn't climb out um, with, with, uh, with those payments. And I'd be very interested to know, to learn from where UBI um, has been trialled and hear from, from the panel uh, about, about the evidence base that has been, because it's my understanding is where it has been trialled it's been a flop. Okay, thank you. I'll take Professor Alcock first and then come to uh, uh, others on the panel. Professor Alcock. The, this discussion does raise an, uh, another sort of contradiction uh, in, the, in, the, in the universal basic income arguments. It, uh, and, and, it's a, and I suppose the contradiction ag again revolves around the level at, at which it's set. If it's going to remove the financial uh, uh, insecurity uh, that people are particularly on the margins of the labour market face, then it's going to have to be a, a, a pretty generous benefit, uh, particularly if it's going to account for people's family size, living circumstances, housing benefit, and so on. And those are the sorts of things that provide financial, uh, pro pro that, that contribute to people's financial insecurity. And if it is at such a high level, then, it, then, then it, it's going to lead to the other problem of why should we pay it to people who do nothing? Now, there's a moral argument there, but there's also an attitudinal argument, which I think would have political consequences. And that is that if we're paying a high level of benefit to people who do nothing, then the support for that benefit, I suspect, will wither away. Uh, and, that, and, and keeping it at a high level will be very difficult to maintain because people will see or, or may think uh, that it's being paid to those who don't need it. Uh, and therefore, maintaining the high level of universal benefit would require a lot of uh, attitudinal and political buy-in, which you're not likely to get uh, because of the contradictory implications of it. So, I, so again, it, it looks like a silver bullet, but actually it misses the target. Okay, thank you. Mr. Lansley, I saw that you were indicating. <clears throat> well, well, can, well, can I deal with, with, the, with the question about pilots? I mean, the, the, um, the Finnish scheme showed uh, a modest increase um, uh, in, uh, in the, the, the people going into work com compared with the control sample. Um, so it didn't reduce the incentive to work. Um, the, the other pilots, I mean, there have been lots and lots of pilots, but the, 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 the pilots that, that, that took place was a slightly different scheme in the United States and in Canada in the 1970s, showed that um, uh, the effect on the incentive to work was broadly neutral, and the only two groups where there was um, slightly less, fewer people working, uh, it was amongst mothers with young children, who delayed a little bit before they went into work, and among students um, who just took a little bit longer to decide what job. So I think the evidence really is that there's certainly, you know, there isn't really a negative effect on the incentive to work, um, and there, if anything, you know, there might be a slight, slight positive one. And we believe that this, this our modest uh, income um, scheme would actually be marginally pro-work. Uh, you know, although different sorts of work, including setting up businesses. I mean, I mean this, this argument about, I mean, that, that, that um, Peter's argument that, um, that, that there will be lots of political objections to it, and, you know, if you're paying it at very high levels. The, 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 the point about the, our modest scheme is that it's a flaw and then the existing system sits on top of it. So it in, so you still, you know, some people still get means tested benefits and so on. So it, and, and, and you know, the, the, the simulations we've done show that it does significantly increase the incomes at the bottom while clawing it back from the top. So I think the, these, you know, the political arguments are very different between the, these big bang schemes and these and the modest scheme. Okay, thank you. Chris Stevens. Yes, thanks very much, uh, Chair. So moving on then to look at um, the rates and perhaps the course and its relationship with the social security system, could I maybe ask um, uh, Mr. Lansley, um, what do you think an appropriate rate for a basic income should be and should it be one fixed rate or should we look at maybe different rates based on need? 
Well, I mean, the, 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 we, we've modelled um, quite a lot of different schemes at different rates, at sort of high rates and, and, and more modest rates. And we found that it's extremely difficult to get um, a scheme with high rates to work. It'd be fantastically expensive, too expensive, uh, that would require huge hikes in, in tax rates. And also there would be losers um, if you were sweet, using it to sweep away the most of the existing social security system. Uh, but we did find that, that systems with, with, with lower levels were very progressive. They, you know, they, they, they were affordable, they were feasible, they cut poverty, they cut inequality, uh, and they cut um, a degree of means testing. And the, the rates that we've looked at were, is £40 for a child, which roughly double the existing child benefit, uh, uh, and a £60 for an adult. I mean, you could vary, we, we pay £60 to all adults, but you could vary it. You could have a slightly lower rate for, for younger adults. Um, sorry, is that £60 a week? £60 a month? £60 a week. Yeah. yeah, so so uh, £40 pound a, a, a child and £60 pound a week, th this would be the equivalent of 10400 a year for a family of four. So it's not enough to live on, but it's a significant sum that is guaranteed. And, I, you know, we think it will have a similar effect to child benefit in the sense that people can plan, they know it's coming, you know, they can ride, you know, volatile incomes and so on uh, and this scheme the growth I mean, we need to distinguish between the gross cost and the net cost right so the gross cost of this scheme excluding pensioners it would be something like 180 billion so that you know that's that's something like eight eight percent of of the size of the economy um uh, but you, you can't count the, just the gross cost, gross cost of, of what it would cost. So, you know, as, as I said earlier, the, essentially, I think we need to look at reforms, the reform as a, a tax benefit reform, and not just a benefit reform. You know, the basic income is as much a reform of the tax system as it is as it is of the benefit. And if you you can pay, you can make that revenue neutral by by raising. Uh, but, but I mean, the abolition of the personal tax allowance, which has become much more expensive over the last 10 years, um, is I think it's around 120 billion. So uh, and th there is a case just for abolishing the personal tax allowance and, 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 and converting it into a cash payment. I mean, you could you could just do that and that would be highly progressive. Uh, and also we put, put on sort of slightly modest increases in the marginal rate of in-tax by 3p the effect of that is that is revenue neutral by revenue neutral i mean that there would be no after allowing for the basic income there would be no net increase in the average tax rate so you so um if you wanted to you could do it more cheaply you could have slightly lower benefits or you could have slightly higher benefits and we believe it, it, you can start small and move over time towards a, a more generous scheme, and we think we think that is um, perfectly feasible and practical. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I can see, you, uh, Chris, can I just interrupt? I can see the Professor Piercher wanted to just come in. Can I take him first and then come back to you? Thank you. Uh, well, on the sort of detail of a of a, of a modest scheme, I, I, I agree with a great deal that Stuart Lansley said. But I, what I don't think is very helpful is to think of having a floor below the social security system, because in um, in some senses the social security system, for, well, for a great many people, is the floor, um, and uh, and and improving that. Um, uh, and maintaining it and enhancing it in the future is, it seems to me, very important. I mean, the child benefit component um, uh, is, 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 is a universal basic income for, for, for children and, and um, seems to me a very strong case for maintaining that. So, so thinking about a universal basic income in comparison with improvements in social security and modifications uh, um in the tax system seems to me a more productive way than 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 waving a new label and saying uh, we'll have a whole new system and call it universal basic income which uh, which it which, 
which is a very much a distraction, I think, from improving social security more generally. OK, thank you. Uh, Chris, and then I can see Professor Alcock would like to come in as well. But Chris, Chris first. Yeah, thanks, Chair. I mean, obviously, I, Stuart, one of the key aspects of the work of this committee is to look at the support and whether there should be additional support for disabled people or people with uh, complex needs. So just to go through the proposal uh, that, that, that you're putting forward today, how do you see the relationship uh, between a universal basic income and the support that goes out to people with complex needs or, or the disabled? Are you suggesting that the social security system stays more or less the same along with UBI or is there other changes you could maybe uh, suggest? Okay, that's for Mr. Lansley and then Professor Alcott. Mr. Lansley first. Yeah, yeah, we're proposing that it's grafted on to the existing social security system, uh, so the rest of the system stays intact. So you, you, you've got almost a two-tier system. You've got this automatic, guaranteed, non-means-tested payment going to everybody, and then top on top of that, some people will come off means testing because of that, and some some people will still need it. So yes, so housing benefit, disability benefits, and other benefits would stay in place. Okay. So, but you, that doesn't d d introducing the floor doesn't preclude making other changes to the rest of the system. I mean, it doesn't preclude improving the, the way we assess people for disability benefit, which is you know needs to be improved anyway. It doesn't it doesn't affect the need to re-examine the whole conditionality and sanctioning system that I think most of us would agree is, is, is gone is much too harsh so it, it, when it isn't a distraction from those other issues it's perfectly possible to fire on more than one cylinder yeah. okay uh, professor alcock sorry i think i, I know there's an, an earlier point you wanted to come in but do you want to make, make your point now well it, well it sort of was yes but uh, i mean first of all i should i mean i don't know if we can get into this debate now but i think the evidence from the pilots is more equivocal than than stuart lansley was suggesting and it's interesting that they've all been pilots none of them uh, have turned into a full-blown scheme uh, another point about the partial basic income scheme which slightly concerns me though is that it's its potential effect on 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 wages and on and, and on employers uh, because this may be an incentive for employers to it, it's basically a subsidy for employers potentially because their workers wouldn't need uh, to be paid so much as they'd already have a proportion of their income provided uh, and now we may want to subsidize employers for all sorts of reasons but subsidizing them on a blanket basis like that doesn't seem to me the most sensible way to support the to support a changing labor market okay thank you now i can see a couple of our witnesses want to come in but can i take debbie abrahams first who wanted to go on from this a little and then and then come to the witnesses um debbie abrahams thank you stephen uh, and good morning everyone um i i think the discussion so far has been quite revealing about our understanding of the psychology of human behavior uh i i'm very struck um by first of all over the last uh, six seven months um, of the, the three million or so freelancers and self-employed who have not been eligible for any, any government support, who are really, really struggling and, you know, a, a, a basic income uh, of, of the level that we have described would have been some help. But I am also very concerned, uh, as uh, Chris uh, has just mentioned, about how uh, a, a UBI would uh, potentially impact on, on disabled people. And I'm heartened by what uh, Stuart uh, Lansley has, has, has just said. However, I would like to know more um, if, if, if uh, he and anybody else can answer to the pilots and how this is impacted on disabled people, but also um, what the um, impacts have been around poverty and inequality. Finally, does the proposal that uh, Compass are, are, have put forward, would it address or, or move towards uh, the minimum income standard um, that has, has been uh, advocated for several years around reducing poverty and inequality? Thank you. I think that's first for Mr Lansley, but I know Ms Dragonova would like to come in as, as well. Mr Lansley, do you want to respond to that question first? 
well, well on, on the last point, um, uh, the, 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 um, uh, so under this system, some people will rise to the minimum income standard automatically. Um, and also we believe that over time, this floor should, should come up. And as the floor comes up, fewer people will need, that will move us towards. So I, I, I see this system a, li a little bit like the beverage system was a kind of starting blocks for a better system. Uh, and, you know, we, we, over time it was improved. I see this as a sort of starter block, you know, for building a better system for the future. So as this very much the next generation that would benefit. So I could, I see over 20, 25 years, us moving towards a fuller basic income scheme. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so, I mean, we, we, as I say, this is, we see this as for political and practical reasons and to minimize the level of disruption, we think we should go for something quite modest. We could even move it in steps um, uh, so it wouldn't be too disruptive. And then that, hopefully that would be enough to sort of win public support. You can't introduce this without public support. Okay. We haven't got and that winners, public support yet. To... Sorry, winners and, and, and losers, Stuart. So particularly focusing on um, disabled people who have been hit so badly over the last decade, who are really, really struggling. It, 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 it doesn't really, uh, nobody would, no, no people on disability would be worse off. But what, Most, what does the international what, evidence say in terms of pilots? What, 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 what was the impact on disabled people from the, from the pilots? That I don't know. Okay. That you mean the, the American pilots and so on? Um, yes, and, Finn, and Finland. I, and, I don't, and I don't, well, I don't, think, I don't know about Finland because I think it was, it was only unemployed people. I, I just don't know. Sorry. And also, we haven't got the full evidence from the Finland study yet. We've only got the sort of first stage evidence, I think. I think Ms. Dragonova, Ms. Dragonova would like to come in on, on this. Yeah. Hi. Um, I, um, I'm afraid I also can't answer specifically about the existing pilots, but um, we did have a lot of people um, with disabilities uh, writing in support of this proposal, and I wanted to, to read some of what they said. Um, so uh, Ross from Devon said, as a long-term disabled person, it might make it possible to work a little when my health allows. At present, a lot of disabled people won't even volunteer in case that is seen as an ability to work permanently. So this is a comment on how the existing system discourages, it kind of, it, it doesn't allow for this kind of flexibility that a lot of people actually really need. But, but I could also, Pavlina, provide you with, with evidence from, from uh, disabled people's organisations which are saying contrary to that. So I do think when we are working forward, we need to make sure that we are looking at who are the winners and losers, recognising um, those the most, ex most vulnerable we need to be lifting up and, 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 and not actually making, making it worse. I, I completely agree. I would say to that, um, and in response also to a comment about how UBI is a silver bullet, it's, we're, I don't think anyone here is arguing that this is a silver bullet or that it will um, by itself solve all of the issues that we have with poverty and equality. Um, it, it, we, I think we are arguing for it as part of a system of measures which doesn't currently replace the rest of the welfare state, but provides a minimum floor which helps to address some of these issues. Um, so I'm, I think that, sh I hope, helps alleviate some of these concerns. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Selene Saxby. Thank you very much, Chair, and good morning. Um, I, it was really, uh, at the very start, Professor Pichard spoke about the cost of the UBI compared to the sort of the current public expenditure. And I was just interested in investigating that just a bit further. Um, and in each of your views, how much would UBI cost compared to current public expenditure on welfare, please? Professor Piercio, are you able to comment on that? Well, well, broadly speaking, that roughly a third of the population is on uh, on, on social security in one way or another. Um, uh, and, and if you were to give a, uh, a, a, an adequate minimum to everyone as a universal basic income, then it would, the gross cost would be roughly three times as much. I mean, it would be just a colossal increase and nobody here, uh, Stuart and um, Pavlina don't, aren't, aren't, aren't 
proposing that, but but that it seems to me if that's if that's what people are holding out as a long term desirable thing, I think one should be aware of the 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 the, the, the cost of it, which which is quite enormous and and. Uh, improving disability benefits, for example, um, is is a tiny fraction of that. So is so so is targeting on on children through universal child benefit um, is a is a very small fraction of that. Um, so so looking at, um, I mean, I would slightly dispute what Stuart Lansley said that the beverage scheme has been improved as it's gone along. I mean, in, in, in a lot of respects, the benefits have declined relative to uh, earnings levels. Uh, um, there have been some extensions in the beverage said very little about uh, disability benefits and di disability co cost of costs um, uh, uh, at all. Um, in fact, those who'd never been in the labor force weren't really included in his scheme at all. Uh, so they were still dependent on national assistance. So there's been some improvements there, but 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 basically the social security system is is in need of a of a of a revamp and 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 uh enhancement and uh and and uh, focusing on that seems to me more important uh than on uh inventing a new scheme and just just in relation to some of the trials it's it's the pilots no one has ever piloted a full universal basic income the finnish one was focused on long term unemployed only um uh and 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 some schemes in some countries have been externally funded and if you if it's externally funded then some people gain from it. There aren't losers or apparent losers. Um, uh, but but were it to be a major redistribution, that 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 uh, uh, paying this uh, to everyone rather than to the targeted um, social security recipients would. Uh, I mean, obviously, one can accompany it with tax changes, but. Um, but but the, the just the net effect of paying everyone the universal basic income would 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 be uh, not at all redistributive. It would be giving benefits not only to those who now get social security benefits, but uh, uh, the universal benefit to everyone. So that would have to be clawed back. Um, so the cost is is potentially colossal of that. Okay. Thank you. I can see. I... It's sensible to consider some of these partial schemes. I can see Professor Alcott wanted to come in on this as well. Well, just on that last point, I think I think we're all agreed that the cost of a uni of a of a of a, a full universal benefits scheme would be colossal, colossally and, and impractically expensive. But I'm also worried about the cost of the partial basic income scheme, which, which appear to be uh, uh, revenue neutral and, and perhaps in one sense can be, but do involve some inevitably involve increasing taxation. And it seems to me that if we are going to make the case for increasing taxation, a case uh, which, which would have my support, I should say, it seems to me there are other priorities than shifting money around between people who already have it uh, within the existing distribution of resources, because we're not going to make Social Security any more generous on this partial basic income scheme. Uh, it seems to me to, that we, if we want to raise taxes, then uh, I would look at things like the National Health Service, the Education Service, uh, 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 and and care and support for social care as much greater priorities in current circumstances than providing a minimum sixty pound a week uh, payment to everybody. Uh, some people of whom won't need it and it won't make any difference to them. Uh, and for those people who do need it, it won't be sufficient to live on. Okay, Mr. Lansley, did you want to comment on this? The cost point. Oh, I mean, I think that, 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 that I mean, just on, on, on Peter's point, it's actually that, that the effect the effect of the scheme is to is to raise incomes amongst the the poorest days, so it doubles them. So it's, it's not it's not this minimum sixty. You know, it, it's combined with the existing system. It has it lifts income significantly at the bottom end. So, but I mean, the, the only point I, I would make in addition is, is that. You can't solve poverty or inequality on the cheap. You know, if we're going to if, if we if we're going to get back to the sort of levels of poverty in, in the 1970s, which weren't perfect, but they're a hell of a lot better than they are at the moment, then um, we need to 
raise the share of national income that, that, that goes to the, the poorest fifth. There, there's no shortcut to that. Um, you know, that, that's what we need to do. Um, uh, and we can either do it by, you know, various schemes of redistribution, that, that we watch basic, or we can do it in other ways, but we have to grasp that nettle. And we have to fire on more than one cylinder. I mean, you know, Beveridge said, you know, we need national insurance and we need child benefit, family less, and we need full employment and we need a uh, national health service. Um, you know, circumstances are different, you know, now. And, and, and you know, but, but if we want the, some kind of new beverage plan, we really want to sort these issues out. I think we, 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 we those are the kind of issues we've got to look at. Okay, thank you. Sulaine, did you want to come back on that? No, I, I'm fine. I'm aware of a short of time, Chad. Okay, Thank you. Time, yes, time is going on. Can I just finally put one question to you, Mr Lansley? The, can you tell us what your proposition would mean for pensioners? Because I, I know that part of the scheme, that I, the Compass scheme that I've seen, um, involves abolishing the state pension. So what, what would you propose should happen to, uh, to, to pensioners' incomes? Well, I mean... The thing about pensioners is that is that we've been edging, you know, towards um, a basic income to pension for pensioners anyway, because we've been raising the sort of flat rate state pension, and on top of that, you know, there is pen pensioner credit. Um, what we proposed in our scheme was to, is, was a slight rise in the state pension. I think it was fifteen pound or something like that, um, and also to to to, to abolish. Um, the conditionality. So it means that those people who hadn't paid enough stamps would get the basic state pension. So, um, and some would still get pension of credit, but obviously fewer would need pay. So it would actually cut the numbers on pension of credit quite significantly. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. Well, that brings us to the end of our first panel session. Thank you to all four of you for being willing to be with us and for a very, very interesting discussion that uh, we've had and very interesting uh, perspectives you've all.